The idea that Japan is especially weird is something that has permeated culture for years, and the video game space included. Yes, you can find highlights of bizarre and strange media from the country all over. I get it. Japan, culturally, is very far away from at least America. The language barrier has only helped maintain that. But at the same time, we created the AMPM mascot over here. We all have weird stuff going on. Though the real harm I think comes when we start quickly labeling things as weird, crazy Japan as a way to excuse not trying to understand something. If you watched X-Plane the early 2000s, there's a good chance you were exposed to Dog of Bay. Not much about the game is actually said. The segment boils down to, hey, look at this weird Japanese furry game. And I'm not blaming X-Play. It was an entertainment-based review show serving its purpose for that era. Even without Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb's commentary, throw this up on screen, especially in the early 2000s, yeah, you're gonna get some looks. When I was 12, I definitely was like, what the heck is this? Dog of Bay is from that line of early 2000s rhythm games like Unison, Space Channel 5, Mad Maestro, and Guitar Man. I'm no expert here, but I feel like these games were asking what a home console rhythm game could look like, and often prioritized more than just pure gameplay by building their story, characters, and world around music. That's definitely true of Dog of Bay, which is set in a bar full of humanoid dogs with a story focused on the life of its performers. I think there are two things that can stop you from looking beyond that. The character design kind of fits in this uncanny valley where they aren't quite fully human or dog. They're not the socially acceptable girl with cat ears or wolf man. It also doesn't help that despite its gameplay being pretty straightforward, it has some weird quirks that make it hard to approach. Dog of Bay presents itself as a simple four button rhythm game, but it's kind of lying to you. It's actually a six button rhythm game and largely fails to guide the player on how to read its incoming notes. There's kind of a multitasking layer to it. There are three places on screen for the players to watch. First, there are these bubbles that represent upcoming notes. You can't tell what they're going to be, though they do help show that the pace of the song is about to change. Second, and maybe most importantly, are the four gems at the bottom of the screen. A shining light encloses on them, and that's where you time your button inputs, with each gem being mapped to a different face button. The last thing to watch is a series of blue notes that fly out from the center of the screen. These notes correspond to the lights on the gems and, at first, appear to be redundant information, but they become essential when you realize the graphics that appear around the gem are very bad at communicating how many notes are coming down on a single track, so it's vital for identifying how many presses you should do on a gem. This section also contains hidden notes that are represented by these small pink orbs. You can grab them using the L and R buttons, but the timing is vague, so there's no real indicator of when you should press them beyond the song's rhythm itself. I'm no good at rhythm games, so I don't want to make any definitive claims here, but I will say it's challenging for me to keep track of all of this. A lot of stuff gets lost in this mess of graphics down here. Initially, it's easy to write off as a bad game based on that since the readability of notes is really important in the genre. But I do think it's an interesting approach where all the information you need doesn't come from one place. When things get hectic, you need to use both at least the gems and the blue notes to inform your inputs instead of like most rhythm games where there's only one icon on screen for each note. There's probably a good reason I don't think anyone else has done this. It's hard to keep track of. Still, I think it's neat. For many of these home console rhythm games of this era, I feel like good enough is probably mostly what they are concerned with. Yes, you can grind these songs to get higher scores if you want, but in cases like Dog of Bay, it feels more like the music is a means to tell their story and immerse you in their world. So as long as you can reasonably pass songs, they've done their job. Though there is one aspect I think Dog of Bay suffers with. Games like Space Channel 5 are particularly good at keeping you engaged with what's happening on screen. It uses in-world movements to represent the inputs you'll need so you can appreciate Ulala's funky dance moves and their full glory the whole experience. What's happening on stage here in Daga Bay? I don't know. I'm staring intensely at this weird, wispy, shiny cloud mess at the bottom of the screen. Without any gameplay integrated with the dance choreography, I think it's easy to lose sight of the significance of the presentation, which is a shame since I think there's a lot to love about how Daga Bay looks and sounds. 
All the music and dance routines fit each character's demeanor, and unlike a game like Space Channel 5, where everything is a stiff up, down, left, right action, these are full dance acts. So even if you play through Dog of Bay, I highly recommend watching these dances afterwards as well, since I think it will give you a better appreciation for each of these characters. At least in my interpretation, Dog of Bay feels very much like a story of outcasts, with everyone seemingly living their life around this bar over everything else. Each has either been abandoned or is running away from something. This is a place where they can live comfortably away from society in their own community of like individuals. Is anybody happy? Uh, <laughs> but they don't have to fear anything here, right? And that's comforting. So why dog people rather than humans? Well, first, they're just straight up dogs. Humans exist in this world, and the relationship between them remains the same in a very, like, ownership variety. So, you know, you are my pet kind of deal. And maybe depressingly, if there's anything that doesn't have any urgency over its life, it's a pet locked in your house. I have a cat. I'm not saying anything about you. Despite the pet analogy, it is still a very human story, and they're doing, arguably, one of the most human things, singing and dancing to win acceptance from the crowd. I think that's why they still appear humanoid despite living the world as dogs. It's to emphasize their vulnerability. They have little control over their lives, or at least less than a typical human. Running away gives them that freedom, though it leaves them with few places to turn to for comfort. Or they could have just needed to make a rhythm game and having a four-legged dog dance on stage for two hours wouldn't have worked. I'm not saying this is definitely what it means. I'm never going to talk to the people who made this game to know their intention. At least looking at it this way, I do think it's one of those cases where everything comes together in a very holistic way. In my eyes, the world, characters, and design all centralize to serve this purpose. To have you look deeper than the character's skin, to find what makes them human, despite their seemingly ridiculous appearance. How these elements meld together is what makes Dog of Bay feel complete, even if there's only like five shortcut scenes and a brief amount of dialogue for each character. Most of that dialogue is hidden in the character viewer section. You have to open and close their 3D model viewer to get their full story. It's weird, but I think it's worth looking at if you want to learn more about this world, which is thankfully something you can do today since the title is now in English. Well, I think the intent of Dog of Bay comes across if you play the original Japanese release. Understanding its small amount of dialogue helps reinforce its character personalities and their struggles. So big thanks to everybody who took the time and effort to help English speakers like me better understand Dog of Bay and give it a moment on the pedestal beyond just the old X-Play skit. I should mention I playtested it, but I'm mostly saying that for disclosure. That being said, it was a great excuse to revisit and rethink Dog of Bay. Not that I ever played the game back in the day, it's just one of those things where it's easy to look at the sad human dog people dancing game and say, ha, furries, then let that inform my opinion of a game for 20 years without ever really questioning it. Even without English support, giving it five minutes of any serious consideration is all that's really needed to look beyond the weird Japanese PS2 game surface and find its aesthetics and world make perfect sense. Also, special thanks to Jillian, Jorik Lubbers, and Sonic Fury who supported me on Kofi.